Are, are you expecting some more people or uh, shall we begin? It's already 4.32. Yeah, good afternoon uh, from India. I'm, I'm, I'm aware that we are all working for the last one and a half years in this different time zones. So this uh, greeting has become a bit difficult now. Uh, but I, uh, I send my good wishes from India and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to welcome you all for this inaugural session of reimagining inclusive cities in the COVID-19 uh, COVID era. And I uh, still remember Sheila Patel's uh, joke. It's like before COVID and after COVID. I am really looking forward to go to that uh, after COVID era, but it is still ongoing. We, I am, uh, let me introduce myself first. I'm Aparna Das and I work with GIZ and I am heading the housing and planning vertical. Uh, we have a large project called Sustainable Urban Development in Smart Cities, which is going to be concluded soon, and we would start our second phase in from January 2022. Uh, under this first phase of this program, we were very fortunate to make a collaboration with CPR, and we did a work on International Housing Symposium, and that's the time when uh, Although it was a housing symposium, but we started working on housing, land, and planning. And over the years, it has really grown. And I'm so happy that, you know, we are no more uh, a bilateral thing. You know, it's, it's like a, a big network of collaborative network has started. And I congratulate uh, CPR for taking that lead here. So this grant agreement that we have now under which this particular activity is located uh, I think it uh, kind of meets the uh, uh, spirit of the grant agreement. The idea is to make a community of practitioners to take this kind of a work forward and also demonstrate that uh, working collaboratively is possible. So this is something that I, I take personally as a, as a big learning lesson that you know, it is possible. And for me, um, you know, I think the questions that we were uh, asking before in 2018 and now has not changed. We are talking about the same thing about inclusive development, but I think it has now become more pressing and uh, we need to gear up and we need to address these issues much more urgently. Um, I, I also uh, would say that, you know, this uh, under this collaboration, when we interacted with a larger network, what we learned is that having a community of practitioners is such an important fact because each Thursday uh, over the last, uh, I don't know how many months when we were working and curating this particular symposium, I would say this was a, a very good adda, as they would have said in Bangla, uh, that you know the adda it was very interesting because it was not talking about anyone's project it was a rich um, you know exchange of information i personally and my team learned a lot and uh, we really made a good uh, uh, kind of a you know exchange of uh, ideas and also knowledge creation i i i personally feel that this kind of community of practitioners and this network needs further strengthening and we should be working towards that and uh, uh, re-articulate our questions further on this. So with this um, um, initial, uh, my remarks, I invite now Shubha Gattu, senior fellow at CPR, uh, who would lay the entire context and also what are we going to be doing in the next uh, three days. So over to you, Shubha Gattu. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's indeed uh, a privilege and a pleasure to be with you all today. Um, thank you so much for um, uh, uh, to the panelists and to the participants for uh, joining us today. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm starting from the end of my presentation. Uh, there, there are just a couple of slides to kind of introduce you uh, to, to why we felt that we uh, wanted to do this. Uh, and the way we've conceived it together. Uh, so uh, reimagining inclusive cities is a theme that we've been uh, trying to imagine for a while. And then COVID uh, has come and, uh, you know, enthused us in, in looking at this in a 
a renewed focus. Uh, we first, uh, we did an uh, international symposium similar to this one in, in 2018. Similar but quite different because uh, I remember uh, we had uh, 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 invited David there to for our opening address, but uh, he couldn't make it then. But Edgardo uh, Rojas did that on his BS. And, and we had a whole set of uh, in-person eminent speakers join us. Uh, and it was, uh, we had 175 participants uh, and it was hosted by, um, um, by GIZ in collaboration with the government of Tamil Nadu. Uh, it, it did uh, span a lot of themes and helped us uh, think through what inclusive planning uh, might look like across various themes. Uh, thereafter, last year, uh, through this innovative partnership of, of uh, institutions that uh, that have been interested in, in this space for a long time now. Uh, we conceived and we put together four what we call policy labs, which were, um, uh, you know, to our sessions on rental housing per se, because India was at that stage uh, suffering from the great migration uh, due to the, the impact of uh, the, uh, the first round of lockdowns in India. And migration and um, uh, rental housing were uh, very much in the focus of government policy. And in, in one sense, uh, a renewed uh, effort towards rental housing was, uh, uh, was being conceived at that stage. Uh, in, in these four workshops, we had uh, more than 20 case studies from across the globe. Uh, and of course, uh, the, uh, the viewership on the online platform made it much more um, uh, you know, accessible to a larger community. We had uh, over uh, 30,000 uh, viewerships uh, and uh, 80,000 um, engagements on social media as an outcome uh, of, of those four events. Uh, those four events are on our website, the recordings are on our website. And in one sense, it's quite a, a resource uh, of, of, of interesting practices from across the world. Uh, on rental housing, I do urge you to go and uh, and look at those two. Yeah. This time round, uh, you know the organizing partners, uh, which include uh, Cities Alliance, EIZ, us at uh, Sci-Fi CPR, uh, Habitat for uh, for Humanity, both from India but also from East Asia, uh, Hardcore, the premier uh, urban uh, finance and uh, uh, housing. Uh, finance here in India, the World Bank, ADB, and the National Institute of Urban Affairs have been collaborating as an organizing set of partners to bring, uh, uh, conceive, curate, and bring to you uh, uh, this this uh, dialogue around reimagining inclusive cities. Um, uh, I mean, uh, while uh, the issues are not so different anymore, but much of um, uh, than what they were in the past in terms of integrating uh, informal settlements and housing and planning. Uh, um, uh, you know, there's a new impetus to look at this uh, issue both at the, at the city level as well as the national level in South Asia, especially in India, where we follow it a lot. Uh, on the other side, there is the whole backlog that this is going to create to global goals of the SDGs, or to the uh, new urban agenda in that sense. Uh, so rethinking of what universal services might look like in the post-COVID era, era uh, is, I think, uh, we all felt, uh, the whole organizing committee, uh, very timely. Uh, so uh, the objectives of these four sessions, uh, three sessions uh, over this week, are to discuss challenges and vulner vulnerabilities of informal residents, and their settlements, uh, mainstreaming uh, city res resilience within this debate uh, of, uh, of informal settlements to make it um, uh, more resilient to, uh, to disasters and to climate change in the future, uh, to look at um, uh, looking at uh, specific interventions that have contributed to this or are contributing to this, uh, as we will see from India, uh, tomorrow, uh, no, day after in the second uh, 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 session two, and then building the community of research and practice that Aparna mentioned 
uh, to look at how universal services uh, uh, along uh, standards can be uh, provided to developing cities uh, in, in, in uh, uh, places which are urbanizing fast uh, well. Uh, so uh, overall, the structure of the International Symposium is across three days this time. Uh, it starts at 4.30 uh, p.m. Uh, in uh, India. Uh, that's, uh, that's 7 p.m. in Singapore, 11 a.m. in uh, GMT, and 7 uh, a.m. Uh, Eastern Time. Uh, the first one that we are uh, engaged in today is about this responsive urban planning frameworks to build equitable, inclusive cities. Uh, the second one, which is on, on Wednesday, the 22nd of September at the same time, uh, is on urban informal uh, settlement upgrading uh, for towards resilience. Uh, and finally, the third one on Friday, on the 24th of September, is on ensuring integration of the informal economy into the city value chain uh, to combat the economic adv uh, adversaries, uh, ad adversities emerging from the uh, pandemic uh, to, to create greater resilience again. Uh, we, have, we are delighted that we are, there is such an eminent panel and set of panelists for, uh, for uh, discussions and presentations. Uh, today, uh, uh, um, uh, we have David Satterwhite, uh, uh, fortunately, to give us the uh, opening inaugural uh, address. Uh, uh, other than that, we have presentations from Fernando uh, Franco, from uh, former Joint Secretary of Urban Planning from the city of uh, Sao Paulo. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Pater, who has led the urban planning work in Mumbai, Metropolitan Development Authority for many years. Uh, and and um, uh, we have Jane Veru uh, from Nairobi, uh, from the university uh, um, uh, there. Uh, we uh, will then follow the presentations up with a panel discussion, uh, which will be moderated by Aparna, uh, which will uh, involve both uh, Peter Rabley from uh, Place Foundation in the US, uh, Georg Hansen, uh, from uh, GIZ India, Hong uh, Suli from ADB, uh, uh, based in Manila, uh, and Teresa Herzling uh, from Sao Paulo again. Um, uh, uh, the day, uh, second day, uh, uh, which is uh, on the 22nd of September, as I mentioned, is on uh, upgrading informal settlements. Uh, and there we will have uh, two presentations from India uh, one from uh, Mr. Mati Vatnan, who's leading the uh, Jaga Mission exercise uh, in Orissa, and uh, Mr. Jay Sharma, who is uh, uh, leading the work in Punjab's, uh, 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 Punjab cities. We will also have presentations from Indonesia uh, 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 by uh, um, uh, uh, Ms. Viraganti. Uh, we will have uh, Faisal Siddharth from uh, Durban. Uh, and we will have uh, 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 these two presentations too before we have a panel discussion. Uh, finally, on the third day, on Friday, uh, when we look at the informal economy and new ways of integrating the economies of the informal and the formal at the city level, uh, we too will have uh, some wonderful presentations and we look forward to having you there. Uh, to uh, watch out for it, we will be posting on Twitter uh, the de more detailed agendas for each of these days. Uh, uh, finally, to today's uh, workshop, uh, uh, to today's session, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we have an opening address and there, thereafter three presentations followed by uh, a panel discussion. Uh, we, I wouldn't want to take too much more time. I'll leave it here. But I would uh, like to introduce uh, David before I pass on to him to make his opening um, inaugural address. Uh, so David, of course, David Satterwhite needs no introduction in a community like this. Uh, uh, but uh, just to say that we are so delighted to have, you, uh, have him here today. Uh, and that over his long career, he has consulted with almost anybody who is interested in this field, has built 
uh, such deep uh, knowledge and has led the sector environment and urbanization, which started off and uh, not so long uh, ago, one would imagine, but uh, has grown to become a premier source as a journal uh, for all professionals working in the field. And needless to say, he, he has been, uh, means the, 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 the awards that he has received kind of speak to his uh, uh, deep effort in the sector, the Volvo Environmental Prize uh, of 2004, and then even being part of the Nobel Peace Prize for the IPCC work that he's been involved in. Um, now David, we are delighted to have you here. I'd like to hand it over to you now. Hi there, thank you for that very generous introduction. Can you see the screen now? Yes, we can. Upgrading has become a conventional government response to informal settlements. There's now a 50 year history of upgrading. We can even get a presidential endorsement of upgrading from Peru in the late sixties when the president decided to rename the informal settlements Young Towns. But planning upgrading is quite different from conventional planning, as the site is already occupied and much of the housing and site layout contravenes official standards. Very difficult to build the information base by which to negotiate an upgrading scheme. Some upgrading projects are isolated examples, others are part of citywide programs and supported by national policies, which show how far they've come in being seen as legitimate responses. At the moment, the, um, the PowerPoint is not allowing me to change to the next. Um, should I share it, David? Stop share, I could share it. No, actually. The forward click should work. Okay, I found the forward click. Great, thanks. But there's many forms that upgrading takes. I reviewed the, um, the, the upgrading programs that I know, most of whom that I've visited. And we got this range upgrading that is actually eviction, rudimentary upgrading, more complete upgrading, leading to comprehensive upgrading then comprehensive community-led upgrading. Then again, this community-led upgrading with a resilience lens, and then finally transformative upgrading. The upgrading that is actually eviction is pushing residents out of the site to rebuild. And the residents get no support for the temporary accommodation that they've had to hire. And then finally, they can't get back into the upgraded buildings because they're, uh, they're charged too much. So in a sense, it's upgrading that is actually eviction. You get rudimentary upgrading where what is provided is very basic. For instance, community taps. There was an aspiring politician who decided to try and generate support for his um, campaign that installed some community taps in an informal settlement. However, after the election, he came and took them back again. Then we have more comprehensive upgrading where you're beginning to get real improvements, piped water, toilets in each home, paved access road, little consultation with residents, although most residents would thoroughly approve of this as long as it didn't increase prices too much and affected in particular rental those who were renting housing where the upgraded building the landlords then charge more for then we have comprehensive upgrading which is essentially moving the households into the formal city 
um, with legal land title, with a full range of infrastructure and services, support for housing improvements. And here there's consultation with residents. Uh, again, as in more complete upgrading, if, as long as costs don't rise too much, this is much liked by um, the residents. Um, and, and last but not least, Asia actually joining us. So in comprehensive community-led upgrading, you get community control and community management. Um, we see some great examples in Cody in Thailand, and the 32 federations that belong to Slum Shack Dwellers International. Increasingly, we're seeing upgrading beginning to take seriously the threats from global warming. And so you get comprehensive community upgrading, but with greater attention to assessing and anticipating future risk. And below this, um, what we'd all have to move to, but as yet not much um, evidence, where you move upgrading towards attention to lower carbon footprints, um, therefore addressing the mitigation aspect of global warming, whereas the above, the one above is addressing the uh, adaptation issues. If we look at government engagement with those to be upgraded, we see at the top, the directed by government, usually implemented by contractors. The same with rudimentary upgrading, usually with in, in, in inadequate maintenance. The number of kind of one-off rudimentary um, upgrading projects I visited where pretty much everything is, is, is no longer used, where the, the toilets are unusable. Um, so it was all about the installation of the facility, not about ensuring that it was maintained. In comprehensive government upgrading, strong community, strong government commitment, but usually much of the construction is through contractors. The settlement becomes formal as it comes to be included in networks for providing policing, street lighting, and solid waste collection. In community-led upgrading, strong government support for it, very inclusionary right from the start where you begin to gather the data um, on which discussions about the planning upgrading will, will start. Strong community-led local government partnerships in resilience, there's some super examples of mayors working very closely with um, grassroots organizations and federations to build resilience. And for instance, to identify major flood areas and to work out how best to address this. And then transformative upgrading. Oh, we've covered all these. I get so absent minded, I sometimes present the same slide twice. So let's look at some examples of um, upgrading that is inclusionary, um, that engages the residents in working out the best solutions. And I'm gonna draw on the experience of the 32 slum or shack dweller organizations that make up Slum Shack Dwellers International, who have developed a capacity to undertake very detailed enumerations of informal settlements, and then present them to local governments as the the information base from which they can negotiate the best solutions. Now, enumerations of informal settlements are not easily done. There's no addresses very often, there's often no street names, so it's difficult to get a sense of um, completeness. There's often hostility towards the interviewers. However, again, if the informal settlement um, dwellers are part of the team that actually collects the data, this hostility disappears. They also are clear that it's upgrading that serves them, not real estate agents coming to look for land for their future expansion. The Slum Shack Dwellers International enumerations engage everyone. 
if they're, they're, they're not sample surveys, when I ask them whether they might do a sample to lower their costs, they said, that's ridiculous. We want to talk to everyone. And as they gather data from each household, they also explain to each household what is being done and why. So everyone in the informal settlement gets to know what's happening. They're done, you know, the actual interviewing is done by residents guided by community leaders. Of course, the foundations for all these are the community savings groups that are the foundation of the federations. Most savers and savings group managers are women who also ensure that their needs and priorities get into the planning for upgrading. In, oddly enough, the enumerations have space for respondents to give their priorities as they, um, as they answer the questions, which is very unusual. Household surveys don't usually ask respondents for their priorities. Censuses don't ask respondents for their priorities. There's a very quick report back of the findings to residents that then generates more discussion. And of course, they provide the data that local governments need. I, I remember being in Katak where the local government was trying to develop a, um, a, a plan to protect community organization with communities from flooding. And a lot of community organizations were engaged in um, how to how to adapt. But the local government didn't have the data, so it was the Federation, the Mahila Milan, the Federation of Women Savers from India, who did this amazingly detailed um, um, database for where flooding took place, how long it lasts, how many people were affected, and so on and so on. Just to give you an idea of the scale of depth and detail in these um, enumerations by SDI federations, I'll give you the example from Kisumu, um, done by the Slum Dwellers Federation of Kenya, Mongana. It profiled nearly 221,000 residents in informal settlements. The data collected was incredibly detailed. So for instance, when asking households about their main water sources, they gave nine possibilities, recognizing that households use different water sources, um, minimizing the, the most expensive. They also gave details on the number of individual community and shared taps, whether they were functioning and the quality of the water. They reported on their expenditure on water and whether this was providing problems for the household budget. They asked about the time needed to collect water and water availability. Now, when this is done for each household, it gives you the basis for planning piped water supplies and looking to see where there's weaknesses in the past. Among the other top topics covered, you had obviously land ownership. What was fascinating for me was that you also had a history for each of the informal settlements in Kisumu. And it's a reminder how many of these informal settlements are 70, 80, 100 years old. You got the, what you would expect, the demographic and structure details. Interestingly, details of evictions, had they felt threatened by evictions that year? If so, give more detail. And a lot of detail on provision for sanitation for garbage collection, healthcare, electricity, etc. Self-reported health issues, details of livelihoods, details of the commercial establishments and the other establishments that were in their informal settlement, such as playgrounds, banks, informal markets, police stations, mosques, temples and churches. The enumerations also asked about the organizations, the community organizations and the community leaders that were active. And then finally, they listed their priorities, what they wanted the, the upgrading to do for them. To give a couple of examples, Gobabis in um, Namibia has a very innovative community-led upgrading program in Freedom Square 
covering over 4,000 people on a 60-acre site. It's led by the Shack Dwellers Federation of Namibia, working with the Namibia Housing Action Group, an NGO with a lot of experience in this, and working with the municipal authorities. Of course, the upgrading was guided by a community-led enumeration that provided the information base from which to plan. They also negotiated lower, cheaper standards. Local government allowed this because it brought such a dramatic fall in the price, for instance, reducing minimum lot sizes. They managed to develop an upgrading that was a fifth of the cost of conventional approaches so that it was affordable to far more households. What you also get from this interesting um, example is a very good relationship between grassroots organizations and local governments. And the Grassroots Federation has, has done a, a complete survey of all informal settlements in Namibia for the government. I'm not gonna dwell on this because I'm sure you folks know this, but the Thailand's Community Organizations Development Institute is a national fund that supports community organizations formed by the inhabitants of informal settlements to plan and manage their upgrading. More than 100,000 households have benefited from this program. I could actually, Jaden Weru is coming later and we'll let, we'll, can fill you in for details, but I'm astounded at Nairobi as to how much the Kenyan Federation, Mungano, has negotiated with city government, with district government, with national government to allow innovative upgrading schemes. One of the largest is the upgrading program they're developing in Mukuru, one of Nairobi's largest informal settlements. It's unusual in the scale, 100,000 households, and the engagement with all stakeholders seeking to generate consensus. In 100,000 households, there's a lot of um, um, businesses and landlords and people with other perspectives that have to be brought into a consensus. So some conclusions. Upgrading, if done well, transforms housing and living conditions. But successful up examples of upgrading usually include and depend on much better relations with informal settlement dwellers and local governments. These successful upgrading programs usually include partnerships with local government. My friend Arif Hassan makes this distinction between big pipes and small pipes. Grassroots organizations and federations can do the small pipes, um, helping lay the, the water connections in their settlement but they can't do the big pipes, the water mains that needs to supply each settlement in the city. There's been some very good partnerships where the community organization did the small pipes and that was then complemented by the big pipes from the municipality. Upgrading with, with municipal authorities usually works with the planning department. What you have to avoid is the other parts of the local government doing exactly the opposite. For instance, while Nairobi has some of the most um, innovative and large scale community led upgrading schemes, just as they were producing the, the upgrading scheme for Mukuru, the um, infrastructure department was clearing roadsides so they could widen the road. So you've got to get buy-in on community led upgrading from more than just the departments you're working with. Of course, these changed relationships provide the foundation from which other, exclusion, other exclusions can be addressed. Thank you for your attention. you're muted. Yeah, sorry. Uh, thank you, uh, David, for this uh, very, uh, you know, kind of a full picture of 50 years of uh, uh, some upgrading. Uh, and this has been discussed in detail in our addas that we were having. And um, one of the critical questions that keeps coming in is that, you know, why it does not ever get scaled up. But uh, my introduction to Mukuru was being very hopeful. And I think it's possible 
uh, with the right kind of uh, knowledge, maybe it is possible to also scale up. So we need to have uh, more knowledge on this and we need to know maybe other skills, you know. It's not only the technical skills, but how does one keep a conversation alive and uh, do this uh, persistent? It's a, it's a difficult job. Uh, many of us actually have gone <laughs> gone gray uh, in this in this, uh, uh, in this particular thing. Uh, but it's a very interesting topic, and I think it is now slowly and slowly, at least in India, becoming a part of the planning discourse. So it is no more that you know it's only the people with the jholas are talking about it, but I think the administrators, like as uh, Shivagato said, in Orissa, in Punjab, they are picking up this issue, and I I, I think there is a positive uh, positive things is happening. Um, with this, I invite now Anna. Uh, who would take this conversation further. So, Anna, over to you, please. Thank you, Aparna. Yeah, um, I'm Anna Claudia Hosba. I'm the regional manager for the Cities Alliance uh, here in Latin America and Caribbean. So I'm talking to you from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it was a beautiful journey with all uh, the school organizers uh, that Ashubagato mentioned uh, from the beginning. So we are partnering up already in our second year in these sessions of uh, discussions. And I believe this one is very important uh, because we cannot reimagine the future of our cities without addressing the urban vulnerabilities and the informal territories that we have in our cities. So COVID had explicitly demonstrated how urgent we need to deal with these territories. Uh, I think it is very nice, um, Dave's uh, presentation, because it just, you know, introduces us a, or leads us to the next session. Uh, Dave talks about relationship between um, slum dwellers and, and, and city governments. And now in this next session, we will hear from three different, you know, cities from Sao Paulo, from Nairobi, from Mumbai, how these uh, negotiations, how these relations evolved into more institutionalized relationship and frameworks, right? Uh, so uh, that at the citywide uh, planning can play a role in terms of supporting the develop the integration and development of these uh, vulnerable territories, basically mainstreaming action uh, in vulnerable territories. In the case of Sao Paulo, Fernando will come first. Uh, we are talking about 20 years relationship, uh, actually since the 70s, right? Uh, almost 50 years, uh, social movements, demonstrations, relationships, you know, a long trajectory of improving the life of Islam dwellers, guaranteeing that they stay where they are, minimizing evictions, and a trajectory, a more recent trajectory of 20 years after um, the city statute of Brazil, which is a very progressive legislation that recognizes the social function of the land. And within this period, two master plans. So Fernando uh, was leading the last uh, master plan um, around five years ago, and he can tell, tell us more. He was the uh, secretary of urban planning in, in the city of Sao Paulo. And uh, well, this master plan um, is, is very progressive and very innovative, um, even for Brazil, considering that we have this legislation at the national level. Uh, so Fernando, I will uh, hand over to you uh, for your presentation. Well, thank you, Anna. Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, it's a big honor to be here talking to you all. I'm gonna share my my screen <clears throat> okay is it nice very nice okay so uh, as Anna said before I'm gonna talk uh, through the point of view of the, the government of the local government uh, which uh, in 2014 has approved a new master plan uh, which uh, uh, which focus a lot on the housing issue. And basically what I would like to, to talk here today is not only about the right to the city, which is in the, the core of the master plan, the regulations in Sao Paulo, but also the right to life, 
which is a very important topic since from the beginning of the pandemics. Well, I'm gonna talk about six actions. Uh, the first, the initial five, one, five ones was actions designed by the government. And the last one is what I suggest that we should go uh, afterwards. And first action is about framing the, the main issue. And here you have Sao Paulo Metropolis image. It's about 60 by 40 kilometers wide. And we have about 21 million inhabitants living at the moment. Uh, the white shape is the municipality of Sao Paulo itself. The, the metropolitan region has 39 municipalities. Sao Paulo is the main one, the capital. And uh, in purple, you can see how uh, the distribution of formal jobs is completely unequal in the metropolitan area. Basically, Sao Paulo municipality is the one who offers jobs, formal jobs, of course, uh, totally connected with the black lines, which are uh, the main uh, mobility the systems, uh, such as metro, train, and bus lanes, BRT lanes. So we can see the connection between government investments in infrastructure and the offer of formal jobs. The next diagram shows something completely different. This is the social vulnerability mapping. And you can see that uh, the urban uh, vulnerability is characterized by urban sprawl, basically informal urban sprawl over the, the environmental sensitive areas, totally disconnected with uh, the black lines, the, the lines that represent public investments. When we put both diagrams together, uh, it's so easy to see the, the picture of an equality of social segregation, territorial segregation that uh, shapes uh, Sao Paulo metropolis and shapes uh, the, the citizens' uh, life. And this picture is responsible for so many issues, so many uh, unbalanced, so many uh, um, dramatic situations that we have to take care about. One of those situations is that informality, vulnerability corresponds to the tax of death by COVID-19 in city, of course. So you can see the, the darkest colors uh, where uh, we, we find uh, the biggest uh, death rates in the city of Sao Paulo and also in the metropolitan of Sao Paulo corresponds to vulnerability. So we're not talking about the right to the city anymore, but we're talking about the right to life. Section, uh, second action is integrating tools for designing a housing policy. So uh, housing is such a complex uh, uh, question. Uh, planning is uh, uh, metropolitan uh, cities is so complex, so uh, no one can find one single instrument, one single tool to deal with this complexity. So the master plan, Sao Paulo's master plan, uh, organized a set of tools that has to be combined uh, in order to achieve uh, a consistent uh, policy. And we have much more than you can see in this list, but basically what we have here is uh, the need of designing uh, a municipal housing plan to guide actions. Uh, a second very important tool is what we call ZAIS, Special Zones of Social Interest, areas designated to the provision of affordable housing. Uh, then we have land regularization, solidarity share, and also uh, uh, some tools 
based on land value capture, uh, which can be really interesting sources of funding all together, uh, one by one, step by step, they can put a housing policy uh, 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 to walk. So one of the first steps uh, in order to do so is providing land access. And the municipality of Sao Paulo, which is about 12 million habitats, has about around 2.2 million property owners. 1% of 2.2 property owners uh, own 45 of the property share of the city. So you can see uh, how uh, concentration uh, uh, shapes the city once more. And in Sao Paulo metropolis, uh, at the moment, we are about, uh, well, housing deficit is about 570, 570,000 uh, units. And believe it or not, we find 527,000 vacant buildings at the city. So uh, as a matter of fact, uh, there is no lack of, spa, uh, of space in the city. There is uh, a gap, a difficult to access the space that has been already produced through private uh, investments, uh, but basically through public investments that uh, are not uh, properly used, are totally spoiled. So uh, uh, in order to, to get those lands and lots uh, and properties back to the market, uh, a very important tool has been approved and regulated, which is uh, PILC, compulsory parceling use and construction, which basically uh, is the, the instrument to, that achieves to guarantee the social function of property. So unbuilt lots, underutilized properties and unutilized properties are forced to go back to the markets through another instrument, which is the progressive urban property tax uh, that uh, has as a goal to, 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 to make the, the owner to take a move to sell or to, uh, to develop the, the, the piece of land. And if he doesn't, do so, then uh, the municipality can expropriate through titles of the public debt, which is not a good deal. Uh, so uh, uh, this is the, the one of the main strategies to get access to land. What happened uh, through the initial two years since the master plan has been approved is that the municipality has notified around 1,260 properties, uh, which is equal to 2.5 million square meters of land. So uh, this amount of land uh, is able to, 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 to receive uh, a production of the equivalent of 880, uh, thousand uh, housing units. So you can see uh, how strong, how strategic can be a tool like that. Well, fourth action is territorializing policies. And going back to ZACE, the special zones of social interest, uh, this tool uh, delimits portions of the territory dedicated predominantly to provide decent housing for low-income population uh, through the provision of new social interest housing and social market housing, as well as urban improvements, uh, Islam's upgrades, environmental recovery, and land regularization. 
So basically we have five types of ZEIS in the municipality. One of them called ZEIS-1 uh, is the biggest one. Uh, it uh, defines 143 square kilometers. Basically, they, uh, they are related to the pre-existing settlements. And the other four, uh, which is about 29 square kilometers, are uh, basically for production. Uh, so you can see the, 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 the amount of land, both already being used for informal settlements and also for production that we, 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 we find in a municipality such as Sao Paulo. The next action is about funding. So since we have access to land, how to fund the transformation of this land, the production, the buying and the production in this land. So basically, uh, Sao Paulo municipality has said it's a very, I can say so, a sophisticated land value capture system. And the master plan uh, defines that the floor area ratio of the city is now equal to one for the entire city. So if you want to build more, you have to pay honorable grant of building rights. And this amount of money, this value capture goes to a municipal fund for urban development called Fundurbi. And Fundurbi can uh, uh, can use the funds for so many policies, but social housing is one of the main one, at least 30% of the funds need to be used for social housing. Well, this fund is not big enough to, to produce uh, what the city needs, but so uh, basically this fund is used by uh, property acquisition. And then uh, federal funds uh, are put together in order to produce new housing units or to, uh, to make process of these funds uh, upgrading. So uh, through time, you can see uh, uh, how this land value capture system has been working in the city. Uh, and the, the, the top line is the amount of the city uh, investments. And the bottom line is uh, the percentage of building rights over total investment. So you can see how progressively uh, land value capture tools are uh, having more participation, more importance uh, in funding public policies. Finally, uh, I would like to talk about supporting communities to reimagine their futures. When COVID uh, began, uh, what we, we use it to listen from the government, from society, from several institutions is that we should, uh, we should have social isolation. It's a little bit uh, weird as a concept. So uh, we decided to change, not talking about social isolation anymore, but about social distancing it's also a little bit bizarre. So we decided to change, not social distancing anymore, but physical distancing, which makes sense in terms of an action to, to help to mitigate contamination and uh, pandemic spread. But what we have seen uh, uh, studying uh, how COVID uh, has impacted and continues impacting uh, informal settlements, informal communities or vulnerable communities, uh, is that um, social isolation, social distance is an absolute wrong concept. 
what we find through a research we did with World Bank, with communities in Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, Belo Horizonte, and Buenos Aires, Argentina, is that as more strong communities, community bonds are, are better those communities are uh, fighting against COVID. So this picture is from Paraisopolis, one of the biggest slums in Sao Paulo, about uh, 100,000 inhabitants living in, and they did a very precious process of uh, self-management, uh, self-organization uh, to combat uh, COVID. And in Sao Paulo, Belo Horizonte, uh, Rio de Janeiro, and Buenos Aires, as better the community organization, as lower the death rates by COVID, we could find even lower the municipal, the municipal uh, average uh, that a uh, rate of death by COVID. Uh, and when the government was together with the communities such as in Belo Horizonte and Buenos Aires, the death rate was even lower. So um, if we want to go and get out through this crisis and the following ones, uh, one strategy should be strengthening of social and community bonds, which I guess is somehow what David has just uh, said to us. And doing so, maybe when we look back to the territory, we will find uh, phase one, which I mean pre-existing uh, uh, communities and formal settlements, uh, one uh, strategic and prioritary territory to act since those pieces of territory are where community bonds most need to be strengthened. Thank you so much. Thank you, Fernando. This was quite a comprehensive uh, presentation. Congratulations for your work. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today. Um, yes, now we move to Africa and we have Jane Veru with us. She is the executive director uh, of Akiba Machinani Trust uh, in Nairobi. And um, <laughs> thank you, Jane. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I see we can hear you well. So yeah, then you can share with us your experience also, I think similar as Sao Paulo, right? After so many years, uh, struggle and negotiations, you know, demonstrations and work, um, trying to work closely to the government and institutionalizing, mainstreaming these vulnerable territories in city planning. And uh, Kenya also got uh, a new legislation right back in 2017, which enabled, you know, um, tools at the city level. So maybe you can share uh, with us more about um, this community Mukuru that was already mentioned by David and the spa. We cannot see you. Uh, I mean, um, mm. cannot see your face there, but I see you are connected. Sorry. Can you talk again? Sorry, hello. Now it's coming, now it's coming. Hello. Yeah. It's Okay. If, thank if, you, you. if you can so hold me, down a little bit your camera, then we can see you too. That would be me, great. Let me, let me, yes, but I think I will put it off because the connection is very poor. Okay, thank the you very much. Do you have a presentation to share or? Yes, yes, I'll, I'll put it, I'll share. Okay. Um, okay, screen. <gasps> <laughs> okay. So just, just Hi, Jane. Yeah, I'm, 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 yes, I still am here. I'm trying to put it to, I'm trying to put it on the screen. 
Yeah. yeah. Just give me a bit of time. Please, I'm sorry for the delay. No problem. Take your time, it's coming now. <laughs> sorry, technology problems. So I can see your screen, but it's still not the presentation. Okay, so probably I can just start. Uh, now I see yeah, files. I see that you have a PowerPoint file there. Maybe yeah. this is the one. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, this is the one. Yeah. Me, mm, sorry for this. I'm not very good at this. I need someone to help me. Okay. Doesn't matter. It's coming. So thank you. Now it's there. Wonderful. Mm. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. So I'll be sharing with you a little about uh, the Mukuru Special Planning Area and um, how, in a sense, this special planning area and COVID, I believe, will help us to begin to Im reimagine. Uh, the development of informal settlements after COVID. And I'll share with you a little about Mukuru. Like you can see this first picture here talks a little about the number of households in Mukuru. Mukuru is a dense settlement that is, that is situated very near the city center of Nairobi. It has 689 acres of land and is home to about 100,000 households. The densities here are very, very high. We estimate that about 214 households share one acre of land. And a lot of the, set, a lot of the area is built on one level. So most of the households actually live in one room houses of about 10 by 10 feet. So the area is very congested. And this area has about 402,000 households. The living conditions in Mukuru are deplorable. I'm sorry, I'm a Kenyan, but I have to say this. The residents of Mukuru during the planning process um, conducted household mapping and enumeration, and they mapped every single toilet, every single facility in the settlement. And they found that Mukuru only has 4,681 toilets. These are generally pit latrines. Out of these toilets, 683, 6, 3,863 toilets are toilets at the household level. So these are toilets that are accessible to households on a day-to-day -day basis without them having to pay. 194 of these toilets are public toilets. And that means that if a person needs to use them, they have to go and pay for them. So we only have 3,863. And these are pit latrines. And from the picture that you can see below, many of them, like the first picture, one, dispose of their waste directly into open drains and fecal wastes and, and rivers. And fecal waste is a major public health risk. You know the public health risks that come with the indiscriminate disposal of fecal waste. And you can see here the same problem with the, that exists in Mukuru in regards to solid waste management. So all of these problems created, create a a terrible, terrible public health challenge. And it is common, and you can see, I, I won't speak to all that, but you can see in the pictures. And, it's, and it is therefore common, it has been common, that cholera outbreaks are common in this area. So you can imagine the fear and trepidation 
that we all had when we heard that COVID was now a pandemic. What was going to happen in the informal settlements of Nairobi with these prevailing conditions? I think for all of us, it was just a sense that a disaster was awaiting. And I think because of this, the government acted in an unprecedented way and provided services in many of the settlements. But probably a question we could ask is why, why, why are these conditions, why do these conditions exist in the informal settlements of Nairobi? One challenge I think that is at the heart of the very poor provision of services in informal settlements is the issue of land tenure. The picture, I think if you will see the picture to the right, that says how evictions happen, you can see that picture of yellow bits of machinery that are demolishing houses within informal settlements is common in Nairobi. And it is common, and it was a common site in Mukuru. Because in Mukuru, the land on which the 680, 689 acres upon which this settlement sits is mostly private land. This land was allocated in the 80s and 90s to private individuals and corporations for the development of light industries. And fortunately, the people who were given these properties did not develop. And that's why we have informal settlements on the land. However, as is common in almost all Commonwealth jurisdictions, the type of titles that were given to the private individuals were long-term leaseholds of 99 years. These leaseholds had special conditions of grant. Those special conditions of grant provided that the grantee should develop the land within a period of two years. And if they failed to develop the land as stipulated in their title documents, the government was empowered to enter and to take back the land. Now, because a lot of the investments, especially in water and sanitation, that occur in informal settlements are financed by multilateral bodies, such as the World Bank, the African Development Bank. Um, we find a lot of influence by these institutions on the policies of water and sanitation utilities in many cities. In Nairobi, the water utility has under its guidelines, the guidelines that, that guide the development of infrastructure, water and sanitation infrastructure in, in informal settlements, provided that no investments should occur in informal settlements that are situated on private lands. So the water and sanitation utilities therefore provide infrastructure only to the edge of the settlements normally. And from there, the water is reticulated in the manner that you see in these pictures using flimsy spaghetti pipes running through improbable conditions. I can only say they're improbable because they're so bad. So what then, how then do we begin to address this challenge? I think the first is that in the reimagining of cities, we must begin to appreciate the special role of planning. 
and in the Mukuru Special Planning Area, uh, the county government declared Mukuru as a special planning area and provided seven planning sectors, which include water sanitation and land. You can see those seven thematic areas. So we must, as we reimagine cities after COVID, we must appreciate the special role of planning. We must appreciate the special role of partnerships and community inclusion, the co-production of planning and implementation with communities, which has happened in this particular planning process that have mobilized 46 organizations and involved the, com in the community extensively in co-production. I think the other thing, and this has happened in Kenya, is an appreciation that public health, the public health interests far supersede the interests of private property. And therefore, in the face of a pandemic, the state or states should enter. And regardless of the title interests of individuals, states should provide the basic services that will ward off present and future, future pandemics. I think that is another principle upon which the future reimagining of cities should be vested. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. I believe this reality is very similar to the reality of many of other cities in the global south where uh, property owners didn't uh, really uh, take care of their land, uh, right? And it was occupied. And then afterwards, a restriction from governments to act upon private land to provide basic services and, and housing. Uh, therefore, it's so important to recognize the social function of the land. Jane, you are still sharing your screen. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, thank you. So now uh, we move to India, to Mumbai. Mumbai. I would like to invite uh, the former head of the planning division uh, of the Mumbai Metropolitan Region uh, Development Authority, uh, Vidya Patak, uh, to share um, about um, the experience of the government of Maharashtra uh, in terms of launching a comprehensive and implementing a comprehensive uh, Islam rehabilitation scheme. Um, so Vidya the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for this uh, invitation to participate in this uh, interesting session. Uh, what I'm going to do here is not to attempt any comprehensive uh, review of the planning system as such in Mumbai, but to concentrate on the current dominant mode of uh, dealing with slums, which is called the slum rehabilitation scheme. So a quick background of the situation of slums in Mumbai. The uh, population of Mumbai in 1961 was 4 million and had a slum population of 12%. By 1981, it had a population of 8 million and 50% living in slums. And by 2001, it had a population of 12 million with 54% of the population living in slums. Now this is a, uh, but is it, is poverty is the only reason why such a large proportion of people live in slums? That is not the case because uh, per capita GDP of Mumbai is uh, something like three times the GDP per capita GDP of India. The right hand side shows a income distribution and also uh, people living in various types of houses. Uh, so that shows that big red area is the slum population and others are different types of houses as you go towards the right. The, this is a graph uh, done in 2010 with um, median household income being about 20,000 rupees. 
And at that uh, stage in 2010, the market in Mumbai was such that only 30% of the population could have afforded a legal house. So that was the uh, one of the reasons why such a large uh, proportion of population has persisted to live in slums. Unfortunately, however, these kind of diagrams uh, can't be very easily uh, uh, developed because there are no um, ongoing data systems which lend itself to uh, analyzing the housing situation in this fashion. This is, this is uh, uh, the Mumbai area, Mumbai city area and not the metropolitan region. This adds about uh, 450 square kilometers of area and uh, currently 12.5 million population. The, there is an obvious uh, constraint on horizontal expansion of uh, the Mumbai city because this is all water, see. Within the city, there is a large uh, wildlife sanctuary and its boundaries have been extended now southwards. These areas are the coastal wetlands, which are no longer available for development. There is an airport right in the middle of the city with its uh, constraints on the heights of buildings. And this is the uh, seaport here. So land itself is constrained and its expansion in a very natural course, which is possible in other cities, is not a possibility in Mumbai. But apart from the nature's constraints, the Mumbai's plans have also constrained its vertical uh, growth. The floor space index in this part of the city was restrained to 1.33 and the rest of the area to one. Now, uh, this has been the case almost from uh, 1970s onwards. During this period, the incomes have grown, the demand for floor space has increased, Housing finance has improved, and therefore the demand for floor space has also increased, but the uh, restriction on vertical growth uh, remained uh, unchanged. The resultant is these black spots are all slums in Mumbai, all over the place, it's almost. Even, even in the uh, uh, area which is called the World Trade Center, very close to the, that, you have a large slum. Uh, this is uh, Dharavi, a major slum. Um, most of you might have heard. And uh, those who have probably seen the movie called uh, Slum Dog Millionaire, this, this, these are the scenes from a uh, similar kind of slums. This is an interesting place. This is uh, near a uh, very important suburban railway station called Bandra. And here, the people have built uh, structures which are five to six levels and uh, these are not necessarily residences but these are work areas and you see those kind of things going up so the though the planners wanted to restrain the uh, construction to one fsi the market uh, thought it otherwise and uh, even in an unauthorized manner these kind of growths have taken place Now, how, how has the policy about slums evolved? Very quickly, during 1950s, there was a, a scheme called slum clearance, where you will uh, remove people from the slum, build public housing, and resettle them in those uh, areas. It, however, it was soon realized that that's not possible. And during 70s and 80s, a slum improvement uh, uh, scheme was launched, where the basic services like common toilets, common water taps, streets, street lights, etc., will be provided. Uh, and also in 1976, a major survey of slums was uh, launched and the slum dwellers were given uh, so-called photo passes. And this, uh, in fact, uh, gave them a kind of uh, security in terms of uh, not being evicted without resettlement. In 1985, there was a World Bank assisted program called slum upgrading within the program called Bombay Urban Development Project. This was uh, 
similar in terms of providing basic services, but it also had the uh, tenure. And the tenure was not given to an individual slum, but to a cooperative society of about 50 to 100 uh, households. The idea was that the cooperative will also uh, take care of maintaining the public services that are provided in terms of uh, maintaining the wa common water taps and toilets, et cetera, et cetera. The target in this program was uh, 100,000 households, but barely 22,000 households could be covered under this program. Because when the project was on, in 1991, the uh, master plan of Mumbai had a provision that uh, the slum dwellers can get free houses. Not free, I think the initial idea was to charge them a uh, small sum of amount and the buildings will be built by the uh, developers, private developers who will get an incentive FSI. But this also did not have a major success. But it created a split between the upgrading programs with tenure and home improvement loans for people to improve their hearts against the promise of a free house in something like eight storied building. So in 1997, the slum rehabilitation scheme was brought out. This is the, uh, uh, the report which made showed this kind of a contrast, the slum like this, which could be converted into housing like this. Uh, this was then extended, I'll, I'll give the details in the next slide. This was also extended to resettlement and uh, rehabilitation of project affected persons. Because around the same time, a major World Bank assisted transport project was undertaken. And there were something like 20,000 households who were affected by uh, the various transport projects and they needed to be relocated and also resettled. So similar program was extended to support the uh, R&R of project affected persons. In 2004, this was extended to an area called Dharavi. This is one of the largest uh, slums within Bombay. Uh, the population is estimated anywhere between 300,000 to 800,000 because everybody can have his own estimates. And uh, the, it is more like a self-contained township because most of the people also have their livelihoods in the same area. So uh, the earlier scheme was operating on a smaller scale in terms of number of households and the developer who can deal with them and create one or two buildings to rehouse them. Whereas here, government thought that uh, this is not very good. We must have a uh, area-wide scheme and therefore they decided in 2004 to invite bids from the private developers to carry out an extensive uh, redevelopment of the slum and they got a, uh, a substantial FSI benefits by way of incentives in order to do that. But till now nothing much has happened in Dharavi but uh, that's a why is it so? It's a, it's a different case. So what is the basic uh, scheme of SRA? Uh, a slum household will get a 25 square meter, which was then increased to 30 square meter house, free of cost. And during the construction, he will be provided the transit accommodation. And on completion, the uh, developer will also make a contribution of rupees 20,000 uh, for the maintenance of buildings uh, <clears throat> once they are occupied. The, for doing this, the developer will get an incentive in terms of development rights. So uh, whatever is the rehabilitation floor space, he will get an equivalent floor space for construction which he can sell in the market. And uh, on the site itself, the total development rights were restrained to three FSI and whatever is remaining that the developer could take away as transferable development rights. For regulating this process, a separate authority was created called 
slum rehabilitation authority and therefore this scheme is also more commonly called as SRA scheme and uh, this regulation uh, allows the SRA to grant permissions and also grant the TDR. This has been attractive uh, politically because uh, what you see is very visible uh, in the place of uh, ground storage, haphazard, slum construction, you suddenly get uh, eight storied buildings. Of course, in now some of the uh, buildings have gone up to 16 and 22 stories. Uh, and there is a promise to slum dwellers uh, that they will get the free houses. Administratively, this is very attractive to the bureaucrats because uh, they don't have to go to the finance department to ask for money. The money is supposed to come from developers. The fact of the matter is doesn't come from developer, it comes from the new home buyers, but that's a different thing. So what have been the kind of physical products uh, that is the outcome of uh, this program? Though the uh, floor space is uh, divided 50-50, that is 50 for rehab and 50 for uh, selling uh, the, the floor space, the land is divided in such a way that only about 30 to 40 percent is for rehabilitation and uh, 60 to 70 percent is for uh, constructing buildings which could be sold. The, the consequence of that is the buildings are constructed too close, poor light and ventilation, and then uh, studies have shown that uh, these buildings have a higher incidence of TB, and particularly in the lower three floors. And these are some of the pictures. These are the uh, rehabilitated buildings. Uh, it's about eight story high, 2.5 FSI. And they look like this uh, and uh, have problems of uh, serious problems of light and ventilation. And these, these themselves are very uh, small units. And uh, there is a central corridor with houses on both sides. So the, the house is really exposed to external uh, uh, external light and ventilation only on one side of the dwelling unit. Interestingly, however, uh, in terms of COVID, the, uh, there isn't much distinction between the incidence of COVID in the high-rise buildings versus slums. Uh, and in terms of the surveys carried out to find out the zero surveys, to find out the uh, antibodies, the slums seem to have slightly higher proportion of people who have developed antibodies as compared to other buildings. So as of now, uh, COVID probably is no longer a major concern in terms of uh, uh, addressing the problems of slums. Quantitatively, what has been the uh, experience so far? The total uh, slum population in Mumbai uh, could be about 1.2 to 1.5 million but only 0.2 million uh, have so far been benefited by this SRA. And in addition, about uh, 0.06 million uh, have got the benefit under the r, &R uh, scheme that is for uh, the um, relocation uh, for the infrastructure purpose. <clears throat> the entire program is really dependent upon the uh, real estate market and the market it works. Now market in Mumbai as elsewhere has been uh, very fluctuating almost from 2008 onwards. And with the uh, pandemic uh, setting in, it is at a very low uh, level as of now. And this has also affected the uh, SRA programs. And currently there are many stalled projects, uh, SRA projects in Mumbai. The analysis done uh, in 2010 showed that uh, if this program is to be successful, then it will take 23 years for all slum dwellers in Mumbai to get free houses. Of course, even making very uh, optimistic assumptions, this is the case. But it also brought out that what it means is that it would put something like 4 million as the additional tax on new home buyers because they are uh, asked to uh, subsidize the construction of uh, slum houses. 
of course these numbers are rather old almost 11 years old so the the amount of tax involved uh, uh, has also increased so apparent success of sra model even in its uh, most uh, modest scale is because it depends upon the uh, supply side constraints both natural as well as regulatory which keep on boosting the prices uh, because there is a scarcity of development rights in the market and uh, this scarcity of development rights is uh, attempted to be used as a solution to deal with uh, housing incentives cannot be a relaxation in constraints so uh, first you create constraint then you relax those constraint and use that as an incentive so this is not the uh, prop uh, the optimal policy option uh, in this case now at the current situation if uh, the developer is redeveloping three units uh, for the uh, slum dwellers it will require a construction about 90 square meters and an equivalent area which is in the form of say two bedroom apartment he will be able to sell in the market now the construction cost of those uh, three slum units itself will be in the region of 2.25 million to about 3 million rupees so that is the element of taxation which is on the new home buyer so naturally the number of uh, people who can afford those kind of houses is also uh, limited in case of mumbai and it has its own problems the promise of free house has uh, emerged as a golden trap for the political considerations having promised such a thing now it is difficult for any political party to get out of such a promise so it's a deadlock uh, as far as uh, slums in mumbai is concerned and uh, even after uh, experimenting with uh, all the possible solutions right from clearance through upgrading through tenure transfers through free houses through market uh, most of the sort of options that are used elsewhere have been attempted in mumbai but still the riddle continues thank you thank you very much vijayada patak for this very comprehensive uh, presentation i think the storyline is very clear and the challenges that you pointed out at the end uh will be um very strategic content for our next panel uh moderated by by aparna Uh, so Aparna, I will hand over to you uh, to start the discussion. Thank you very much, Fernando, Jane, and uh, Vijayada. Thank you. But you are on mute, Aparna. So oh, sorry about this. <laughs> uh, thanks, Anna. And after this three very intense presentation, and also the first one, um, I'm just wondering the the conversation that I thought we would have today is kind of getting layered. So um, excuse me if I in the middle go somewhere else, but then you know my role would be uh, to have a conversation, and this is not to find a solution, but just to figure out. everyone's point of view and uh, i have tried to further focus and you know make it a, a bit more um, pointed discussion uh, so i am very happy and i am very fortunate and privileged rather to be the moderator for this session which would go for next one hour um, and um, i would like to first um, invite all my uh, panelists i begin with uh, ms sheila patel who is the founder director of society for promotion of area and resource center spark as it's known as and uh, i think we all got a lot of advantage of uh, working with her observing her and how she has shaped this entire discussion under under on the informality and uh, informal settlements so i invite uh, sheila patel uh, in this discussion the issue is that um, uh, 
I do not see everyone, and uh, so these are the challenges of uh, digital discussions. But um, I I invite her, and I'm not sure whether her her um, camera is on. Next is uh, Teresa Herling. So I'm also happy to inv uh, invite Teresa Herling, whom I have met in the policy labs and being benefited by her presentations. And uh, she is an uh, urban and housing specialist, and she is with uh, McKinsey University. And uh, it's, been, it's been quite interesting to see her viewpoints on uh, master plan of Delhi. So I have been following her work. Uh, next is Peter Rabley, whom I have not met ever, but I have been getting familiarized with her with his work, and uh, I have uh, kind of you know would like to know more about uh, his work and what is he doing uh, in this space of GIS uh, mapping and uh, digitalization, which is I think also a bit of a GIZ obsession that we have. And next is. Um, my colleague and uh, director of this project that I am in, uh, Georg Hansen. Uh, Georg Hansen is also uh, leading our project in India, but also has an experience of working in uh, Germany. So he brings this both global south and global north experience. And last, again, my colleague from Policy Lab, uh, Hong. And it's been also a pleasure to meet Hong and interacted with him over this last uh, almost now two years in the policy uh, dialogues. So the way I have structured it is um, I would give a uh, small opening remark and we would have two rounds of discussion and uh, the questions would be in a group and uh, it's an open ended question. It's not that you know yes or no. So I would also request you to explain a bit um, and then um, uh, have a you know kind of a, a bit of a kind of exchange on that. So that today's uh, idea is to discuss um, responsive urban planning framework in building equitable and inclusive in the time of pandemic. Now that's what the task is. But what I have done is that uh, in one hour you cannot discuss everything. So let's discuss a very pointed question about. And I am always putting India as a backdrop, but I would encourage my panelists also to, uh, you know, kind of bring their experiences from other countries to enrich the conversation. Um, when we say planned development, because we are trying to figure out a responsive urban planning framework, but when we say, you know, planned development, what exactly do we mean? And is it a consensus on this planned development? Uh, from my limited knowledge of working. It seems we are losing a partner. Yeah, we can't hear her. Yeah. So I think we lost her. Right. So let's let's wait for her to come back. And I think she already invited the speakers who already opened their cameras. Uh, so maybe we can start, you know. I'm here. You uh, your here. Your back. I was just <laughs> emergency taking I was over. Being just, I was just being told that you are you are timed out. I was saying, no, no, I have lots to do right now. I cannot be timed out. So they allowed me, the Zoom allowed me again. Thanks, Zoom, for doing this. Okay, so um, um, just to get back to the discussion, so what I am um, going to be kind of, you know, narrowing up down the discussion on planned development. And as I was saying that, you know, uh, in India, we have two schools of thought. One school of thought, which is being also promoted and also advocated by the uh, administration, is that if we plan well, and when I say plan right now in for this discussion, I am focusing on spatial planning. Uh, when if we do, if we plan well, we would have an inclusive city. And planning well means that we do, we have the good data resources, we do all the things right, and thing, things would happen, and we would end up having an inclusive city. Now, there is a counter argument to that by different scholars, and uh, they uh, say that, you know, it is the inclusive city, the, 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 the city that we have, 
which is extremely fragmented is the outcome of the planning is the outcome of the planning that we have adopted so uh, i really like uh, what gautam bhan says that what is planned does not exist on the ground and what is on the ground does not exist on the plan so he argues that this um, illegalities or you know this this aberrations that we have is not something that is natural it is an outcome of the planned thing that we have done is giving the rise to this kind of uh, inequitable cities and what um, i do not agree with it because i don't think uh, in india planners are that empowered that we should hold the entire responsibility of creating this kind of cities but what uh, duno roy says is that the the worst aspect of the failure of planning was the fact that planners did not even understand the implication of what they themselves have done so uh, he is saying that the planners do not even understand you know the things that we are planning and and the excitement that we have about gis and mapping and everything is actually we are oblivious of this fact uh, so I, i just wanted to get this two aspects of uh, notion that we have it in india i am not sure whether all of you agree with it or not this is my reading and i would like to take this conversation further with first set of question that would be addressed to sheila patel and uh, uh, peter rabli uh, because i think sheila patel has done mapping and uh, figuring it out the claim of citizens on the city's resources through a very different methodology and uh, peter is doing it in a different way so what i want to okay. understand sorry uh, sorry okay. pod i am sorry if i have uh, sorry no no go ahead go ahead okay okay so um what i would like uh, first to uh, reflect on it in a country like india where there is a skewed power equation is it possible to move to the de jure legal rights through a technological intervention and then expect that we would have a equitable uh, city you know that we would be achieve, able to achieve that so i would like to first figure out uh, or or invite sheila patel to speak about it that what do you think about technology equity and this claim on cities land or resources through the de jure rights which would you not know, take us to a uh, you know all this talk about individual property rights conclusive titling that is what we want to we aspire to achieve and then would like uh, uh, mr rabli to talk about you know what does he think about how technology can be used in a context like india where 80% people are employed in unauthorized uh, segment most things are informal the the the, the justice system is not strong uh, as you know that you know most of our courts are jammed with uh, land related disputes so in such situation how could technology work so i invite first to uh, shila patel ji to talk about it and then uh, mr rabli yeah thank you uh, over to you apna how much time are you giving me how much time are you giving me to speak 5 uh, minutes 10 minutes 5 minutes yeah okay because so yeah. so thank you very much uh i've attended uh, all your sessions after a long time and i truly represent the deep dismay of dysfunctional planning by dysfunctional professionals in a dysfunctional city environment with no with full apologies that this is not intended as a negative thing for anybody but every instrument has to have a framework within which it functions well you take the you take all the cities of the global south just don't take bombay is a deep deep aberration but you sorry i think uh, her connection is not good we 
exponentially increased by the challenges of climate change. This has to be dealt with by cities that most national governments are destroying because they treat them like the golden, the, the goose that lays golden eggs. They don't make adequate investments. Uh, the whole land ownership structure, which we have inherited from the colonists who distorted it in the first place, produces an artificial situation of who is legal, who is illegal. And for the past 50 years, all land security de jour has been based on past eviction uh, notices. I remember in 1985, all the informal pavement dwellers living in the area called Burnley, half of them couldn't get an alternate, uh, just land. One minute. Parag, let me finish. I'm sorry, sorry, Aparna. <laughs> I'm having a Wi Fi. Everybody wants to close the Wi Fi down. Sorry. So, you have a situation in which you have a crisis of every sort. You have cutoff dates that change politically every couple of years. Therefore, the eviction notice that you got five years ago becomes the basis of you getting some entitlement now. So the lack of documentation, the lack of strategic political insights by slum dwellers to use this in an imperfect environment exacerbates everything. So what happens is we all have our planning standards, the DC rules, all designed in an exclusionary manner to produce the perfect formal city that aspires to bring foreign direct investment. What is your smart city program? It's not smart to bring slum dwellers, water and sanitation. It's all about Wi-Fi and getting more digitalized and thinking that that's going to make it smart. That's what it ends up in the essence in the public. So my, my concern is that if, if we cannot anticipate how the city is going to morph into different forms. 15 days ago, the, uh, uh, the climate change process said the, the rise in water is going to happen. Half of Bombay is going to go underwater. Even if one fourth goes into water, what is the implication of that? I have not seen a single politician, a single technical person talking about that. So what I'm trying to say is that these conversations that we are having are, are deeply, um, are really um, unfortunate because like you say, there is this kind of great division between what is it. Uh, <laughs> phone, phone connection you have. Um. Oh just God. God. One second, and I'll just finish because I'm having too many disturbances here. So the important thing is, what is the reality of India and the Global South's whole urbanization process? We are countries that have huge poverty deficits that are not going to be solved by cute little tinkering of little plans. And hordes of people are going to move, they're going to do things, and all the digitalization that we are inheriting from global excitement of big data and everything are not understanding the political value of data that must be in the hands of poor people. Because in India, you know, Aparna, that all the data that was collected five years ago cannot be found in government offices. Most of the people who have access to it are selling it informally. So all the things that you guys like GIS and all the international people who want to utilize data for the good of urban planning, you must understand the politics of knowledge and how it goes to whom and what it does. So I have no, I, I, am, I, I want as much data to come in the hands of the poor 
but I want them to own it. I want them to decide what to do with it. I want them to figure out what questions to ask. None of the global institutions give us permission to do that. They all want to extract our data in a very benign way. It must be done the way they want it. It must be done on their platforms. Those platforms become expensive. We cannot afford it. And I don't think that anybody's talking about the politics of data in this conversation because more and more planning is dependent on good quality data. And what Jane spoke to you is a flagship pro CI. We cannot these towns in big cities, which are there hundreds, hundreds of them by these conventional plans coming from politically are the way forward. They may be having flaws, but that can be changed. But I challenge conventional planners, they will not touch this process. So I, I put this challenge back to this session of what is your imagination of a city and what it needs to do. Thank you. And I'm so sorry with all these disturbances, but I have everybody coming and saying, can I put off the Wi-Fi? So I'm going to leave right now. And I'm, I probably may listen to the conversation, but I won't be able to participate in it anymore. Thank you. Absolutely fine. Absolutely fine. Uh, I think your point is uh, something that we also had been debating. Uh, I think actually, in fact, uh, in the today only me and Georg were having this big conversation about, you know, how this data, what is the data policy, how the data uh, you know is shared so this conversation is not that it's not happening but um, uh, i would say uh, the the smell or the sense that you bring it from the ground uh, it, it is something that we need to be aware of because uh, this has been uh, what we see in mukuru uh, and what we see in our smart cities program i think there is this uh, disconnect so i am not uh, I, I am completely, I understand the, the, I understand that passion and that particular thing that uh, Sheila ji has just brought in. It's unfortunate that she won't be able to listen to the other side of story uh, that uh, I think uh, uh, would be presented by Peter. Um, what, what I really feel is that, you know, this conversation is actually not new about this, you know, uh, this idea of our unintended city. So I think the Joyce said it in, 1976, and even uh, Gita Divan Verma said it very recently. So this unintended city, like, you know, we all behave as if we are the do-gooders, and that's the reason we would do it. But then what happens is something that is very different. So uh, may I now invite Peter that you are an GIS enthusiast, you believe in technology, but tell me how do we, uh, what is your opinion that, um, how do we do in a country like this where uh, the power equation is so skewed that uh, I, I was part of the GIS mapping that happened under Ray and all municipal corporation after taking this uh, thorough GIS uh, mapping exercise, all they ended up is with the PDFs. They didn't have access to the open files because they were not having that capacity to work on that. And they, all they received is a PDF and then the consultants went on telling them, you give us a new consultancy or the next one, then only I tell you what is in that file. So we do have a lot of experiences and uh, this uh, uh, asymmetry in the knowledge, but I would like to know when you implement what you are seeing in a country like um, India or this global south, what are the changes that you are thinking of? Yeah, over to you. I don't think I see you, but uh, let me see. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Afana, and uh, thank you <coughs> for asking me to join. So uh, I should first start by saying I am certainly not an academic and I'm not anywhere close to the august uh, members of this group in terms of their knowledge of urban systems and planning systems. I am a technologist with 30 plus years. I've spent the last eight years doing investments and grant making at a media network, some of which was in uh, India and some of which was around uh, um, slums and uh, various other uh, activities. Um, I, I mean, you said a lot, Apana, in your uh, 
in your sort of question to me that that seems is sort of um, conflating a number of different issues. I think the uniqueness of of control of information to extract value in India is is not unique to India. This happens all over where uh, people control information for uh, their own personal gain. Um, and certainly the the uh, what you describe in terms of limiting access to PDFs and saying you've you've got to pay me or engage me more to give you is not an indication of what technology can do and what it has done. Uh, that, that seems to me a very specific uh, issue that could be dealt with separately. Um, on the one hand, technology is uh, inevitable, it's essential, and you have to figure out how you're going to engage with it because whether you like it or not, <laughs> it is uh, ever increasing. Um, we have more and more ability to surveil people in real time, including the poor, whether you like it or not, um, and whether you grant access or not. Um, I think what's more important is how do you lay the principles uh, around which uh, you have policies that allow for engagement in this information. I think that's true whether you're a shack dwellers organization, um, looking to structure governance for how information is managed within shack dwellers or uh, how you might have corporations uh, collecting data and engaging around uh, the use of that information and the sharing of that information. <clears throat> I would point you to something that we had funded towards the end of our work at Amidia Network, which is now a global set of principles around the ethical use of location data, which is now called the LOCUS Charter, L-O-C-U-S. And it's precisely an attempt to engage government, academia, civil society, and private sector on what good looks like in terms of um, the use of um, location data. So we know that um, when we look at COVID analytics over the past 18 months, um, the ability of Facebook, Google, and Apple to provide information about communities, low income and otherwise, and their daily mobility, um, and not just how often they move, but where they move and at what times they move, has proven to be essential for uh, COVID response. And these platforms are continuing to collect information because people, whether they're <laughs> knowing or not, are continuing to uh, create a daily exhaust of data that is harvested, um, most of the time for which they don't benefit. So these data volumes are enormous. They will only increase you can have a, a reaction of a government to completely ban or shut down. And we've seen that that doesn't typically work. So the question is really, how do we create a, an environment for the good use of these data um, and um, put them to good use? Because there are tremendous benefits uh, to be able to have the type of information that is useful to all who are trying to deal with this problem. Um, there's a benefit for people hiding in the shadows, whether you're government, private sector, planners and practitioners, you can, um, you can fudge things, if you will, you can uh, deny things, you can be held unchallenged, um, you can be held hostage by anecdotes, uh, by those who are supposedly experts um, to promote a particular viewpoint. So I think uh, information is extremely important. Um, we funded some research by Duke University and IIMB of Bangalore a couple of years ago uh, to use field data, high resolution satellite technology and machine learning to identify the location of slums by um, structure type in, uh, in Bangalore and compare it with the official record. So no surprise, we found 10x the number of slums uh, on the map, and we've uh, projected many more uh, numbers of population. We were also able to identify very rapidly, thanks to the work of IMB Bangalore, the value of informal housing transactions 
uh, by location and, and the different structures of the neighborhoods showing that these were not homogenous. So this information was extremely useful in bringing together a number of senior politicians and practitioners to have a, a rather frank dialogue around uh, economic value and lack of capture of economic value and so forth. So having said all of that, of course, technology as, as a technologist, uh, I'm not gonna pretend that it's the answer. And I think it's naive to suggest that another magical uh, machine learning algorithm is somehow going to solve these complex um, social uh, and other problems. It, it won't, of course not. But without the technology and without the data, you don't stand a chance. And without addressing the power imbalance of the way data is collected, I'm not talking about foreign consultants, I'm talking about digital platforms which is where the real power imbalance uh, lies today. If we don't address engaging with those power platforms and utilizing that data, then I don't think we can uh, move forward. So Apana, let me stop there. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, hopefully that was your counterpoint to Sheila. So <laughs> I'll leave it there. Yeah, uh, uh, is this, uh, I would say that there is never this, you know, yes or no answer and um, uh, technology is very important. Actually, we the way we are today is because of technology. So we cannot deny that you know that there is a uh, there is a kind of a contribution made by technology. Only thing is that you know who is using it for whose benefit and how it is used. And I think the state does have a big role uh, in in defining that. So uh, our data. Uh, policies, you know, our data safety policies and all those stuff. I think these are all uh, things that a state has to take a decision on and uh, uh, it is not completely in the private domain. So it's interesting to take these two viewpoints. And uh, I also have a have a point there, you know, like I think that technology has helped poor people a lot, at least in India with the mobile phones. Uh, I think the poor has much more they are more connected, they have more access. So maybe technology, we cannot just say that it is always anti-poor. Let me move to the next uh, discussion. And here I invite uh, Georg, Hong, and um, and uh, Teresa. And uh, this is a very, uh, for you, uh, uh, three of you, I would like to ask that, you know, in case of, uh, Taking the backdrop of India, like you know, that is what the Global South representative, what we need to have as a prerequisite to do spatial planning. You know, we are talking about spatial governance, we are talking about spatial equity. Now, what do we require as a prerequisite, which is a must, must thing, without which we cannot do it. And in this pre-COVID era, it also has opened up more uh, more i would say aspects like the like the discussion on urban commons which is not really done in india as such uh, and when i say urban commons i mean public space as a subset of that now those things are not part of our discussion or part of our vocabulary so if this is what uh, the the new situation so what i would like to know from three of you in very briefly maybe two minutes or three minutes each. Uh, what exactly is the, you know, the cornerstones that we need to first place it instead of saying that, you know, it's the planners who is at fault, it's the politicians who is at fault, or uh, we do not have um, good, um, you know, knowledge or we do not have the capacity. So not fault finding, but um, what do you think are the prerequisites for doing a planning? So shall we start with uh, Hong and then, uh, Teresa and then lastly Georg, is that okay? Yeah, thank you, Apana. Yeah. Can you can you hear me? Yes, very well, very well. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me. It's my great honor. And actually, <laughs> summarizing the prerequisite for the planning for two minutes is uh, impossible. But let me try, and then maybe. I can get back to you. I mean, if uh, there will be any uh, remaining times. I think, uh, uh, yeah, it's related with the technologies and data 
for the objective and consistent and uh, sustainable uh, planning, sustainable way for urban uh, development. Uh, uh, Dr. Patak highlighted the rehabilitation project and then and uh, from the earlier address, we uh, went through the slum upgrading different policies for um, uh, slum development. And then uh, I think we need to understand the big picture of the urban planning, taking into consideration the um, redevelopment and regeneration uh, as an integrated mechanism under the mid-term and long-term uh, master planning um, uh, approaches. I think it's easy to say and easy to highlight, but um, uh, we understand that it's really challenging. I mean, it's more challenging than the uh, just one point asylum upgrading. Uh, and um, um, it's really, yeah, challenging to achieve the, um, the constant and transparent way, uh, especially under the uh, change it, uh, politics and uh, rapid uh, urbanization. And actually it's uh, even uh, uh, challenged in even uh, developed uh, cities and countries as well. So I think um, we need to understand uh, maybe uh, the, the, the city's uh, character and capacities uh, such as a trend of uh, economy and anticipated urban growth, uh, considering maybe the population distributions and what is the existing density uh, considering the viable infrastructures like uh, transportation, energy, water, waste, uh, public space, et cetera, uh, maybe uh, through the um, uh, objective uh, planning through the uh, data or uh, technologies. That's it from me, uh, Apana. Thank you. So Teresa, um, as you come from the land of, uh, um, you know, land having a social function. Uh, would you like to speak about it uh, um, a bit more uh, kind of, you know, in a narrative way? Because we have seen, uh, I would say, you know, let's keep it as a conversation or would you like to use the PPT? Yes, uh, I, I'm, I'm just uh, using this PPT to, because it was a very thought provoking uh, uh, discussion this morning, uh, this morning here for Brazil. And I will be very quickly in my comments. Uh, as a manager, as a, I was a manager, I was a secretary also in uh, Sao Paulo, joint secretary of Fernando. I would say that the prerequisite is the information. Uh, the, we need to know the problem and we need to, um, uh, to know this, to plan the investments. That, Another prerequisite is, also, is, of course, the financial resources. So we have to plan it in a, in a mid-term way uh, so as, we, uh, so as uh, that we uh, apply this, the financial resources to the prioritization, uh, to the priority uh, islams, okay? But uh, in Brazil, we have um, a very strong social movement. And so as an academic also, and as a social activist also, do you hear me well? Yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah, we sorry, do. <laughs> sorry, uh, this was uh, up, up, upside down. Well, as, a, uh, as an academic and also as a social, uh, as an activist uh, of the um, rights to the city, I understand that the social movements organization are a very, 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 very important prerequisite to, to foster the public policies to go forward, to look for this uh, situation and to prioritize the financial investments in these zones. And these social movements in Brazil was responsible to, to make a, a very uh, important achievement in the uh, fr legal framework. We have here the city statue and we have the social, uh, uh, the special zones of social interest that guarantee that the public policies can invest in even in the private uh, land. Uh, and also to have, uh, to, to 
to bring the titles to guarantee the permanence of this public uh, of these people there. But as also as an activist, I would say that it's very, very, very important to bring this information, this data, uh, this information about the whole planning system to the ground, to the public schools. Uh, to the this was a, a yesterday um, workshop that we made in the school in São Paulo to just uh, to to with the students to uh, for them to know this global information system, this planning information. And so you see there in the, in the right corner, upside, uh, up uh, right corner of the uh, picture that we have a system uh, being um, shown in the, in the teller and the picture. And uh, the students are recognizing their, um, their land and with this, we are aiming to recognize rights, to recognize um, and to foster these social movements to be stronger. So I think there is a lot of prerequisites. I wouldn't say that one is the most important. It depends on the uh, point of view. Okay, that's right. That's Thank you. Time. Thank you. Okay. I think, uh, uh, yeah, Teresa, you you kind of you know identified a very interesting thing. And uh, apart from the information and uh, financial resources and everything. I think what I really liked about it is this uh, social movement that everyone is engaged in this process. It is not that you know some some people plan for me and I accept what they have planned for me. So I think that makes a lot of difference uh, in acceptance. So may I now request uh, Georg uh, to come in, please, Georg? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Aparna. Um, I also find this question pretty complex. Uh, however, um, I will try to dive in a little bit. I have jotted down a few points. So first, this thought that, of course, you know, the planning of urban spaces is, has to be a democratic process, right? Other than a private house. So the architect of a city has a different job than the architect of a house. He is sort of accompanying this democratic process and his clients is sort of the full society of the city, the citizens. So the prerequisite of spatial planning is that we acknowledge this open democratic process, this discourse where everyone has the right to participate. And I see in Germany, now I will not talk about India because this is a little tricky to me, right? I just talk about Germany that still in Germany, people are not really aware of this right. They know somehow they have this right, but if you actually, you know, uh, and I've seen this, if you publish a master plan, if you ask people for feedback, what happened is that some old people show up and that's it. Uh? So I have really seen this um, and I found it pretty sad because, you know, it's a fundamental democratic right and people don't really make use of it. So from the citizen side, I would say, guys, you have to learn this and practice this process, and make use of your rights. From the public hand, I would then see here the duty to teach and to actively assist uh, the, the citizens to, to do this process. And uh, in Germany, we have quite some interesting court cases in the last years. Um, that really show that um, the courts see this also, yeah? that the, the cities have to become more active, um, really pushing the citizens uh, more with sort of with the nose on this and uh, actively um, involving them in this. Also, you know, discussing or, or inventing other formats of participation. To hang a plan somewhere is, is not enough. Yeah? They have to engage uh, professional PR people, planners that are more like moderators, yeah, that are able to sort of steer a discourse, to highlight uh, conflicts and moderate these conflicts in, a, you know, in an open participatory manner. So that's from my perspective in, in the core of urban planning. Because when this process in a democratic way is working and 
you know, a lot of people are involved in this. From there, the rest is all downhill, I would say. It's easy to, to, to reach them. But if this very core of, of you know, planning, if it's not democratic, then we can just forget it from the very beginning. Back to you, Aparna. Thanks, thanks, Jörg. Um, I think I'd also just to share here that it is not that uh, 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 in India this is not possible or it has not happened. Because when I reflect on the Ente Kochi experience that we had in uh, Kochi, I think this has been, uh, there is a potential. And now we also see in Odisha the way the entire Jaga mission is handled. Uh, there is a spark there. You know, it's possible to make it happen. It's just that we need to now assimilate all these energies and uh, detail out these processes. Um, I have uh, another uh, five, 10 minutes with this discussion. And I, as I told you that I have made it into two rounds, but uh, this time I request um, just to be very brief about it, because we also would like to know uh, kind of, you know, what is your um, what is your opinion about that? If we want to achieve this partial equity and partial governance, so if you are being given a chance, which thread you would pick it up or which are the geographies in a city where one should start intervening so this is again a very uh, open question all i'm asking you that i know that we need to do many things but if for today's conversation if you have to pick up one point and one geography within the city where would you like to focus so maybe i can start with uh, Teresa, you first, and then pick up the other conversation, other people. So, one minute for you. If you have to do one intervention, one stream, and one geography within the city, where would you do it? So, I'm also trying to understand if we have to have an action point, what shall we do? Is that okay, Teresa, to go first? Yes, 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 it's okay. I think I would uh, start from Islam, uh, Islam upgrading. In Sao Paulo, uh, I think uh, you are uh, questioning me about my city. Or yeah, I'm, I'm asking you that if if you are been given this one city, so which right. which one do you pick up first? You know, which action? So I'm just trying to get an action plan for you know if you have to do some yeah. action. Yes, I would I would make the Islam upgrading uh, program at the first level. With social finance resource, uh, with financial resources, with social participation, with the legal framework amelioration, and etc. Okay, so experimenting more. everything in a small geography. Yeah. Okay, I understand that. Uh, may I uh, ask your you to come second, like next? What What yeah. could you? Do? This is a hypothetical mm. question. Yeah, yeah. To do with I, I get I get your point. I would choose. Um, the inner city, a random big city, and then going really in the inner city. So for example, Amnabat, the inner city, right? Uh, where I have a rich history and this huge problem of having no idea what to do there because sort of somehow the, the new modern life and the old physical structures, they don't match with each other. Yet these spaces, with the small you know plots and, and everything else is so magic and it's so built around the human scale so to bring these centers to the future that would be to me as a planner a fantastic opportunity and of course it needs a lot of money to do this but i would be really interested to you know to showcase that this can be a, a good you know contra point towards a greenfield development in the peri urban areas uh, with sort of your own roots in the ground. Back to you, Apana. Yeah, thanks, Job, for being so specific about it. Uh, may I now request Peter to come in, please? What would you suggest? I would suggest not asking me <laughs> because I don't know enough to be perfectly honest with you. Okay, let me re-articulate the question. What I'm saying is that, you know, it's a hypothetical question. If you are being given a chance or a choice, 
to pick up one city hypothetically and say that okay this is the uh, intervention i would like to do for example i would start working with say uh, what uh, gyan just said you know i would do a work with a inner city which has all the elements of the complexity that a global south city would represent uh, there as i said that she would pick up a city so i'm just wondering in your data or your gis mapping and the rights property rights aspect uh, if you are being given a choice what would you like to pick up if you take india as a as a city as as a country well, if if we look at india i think uh, it would be very interesting to dive into um, the conversion of a supposedly agricultural land under the revenue department into the urban sector and the lack of institutional transformation of record keeping the fact that the revenue department doesn't like the reclassification and holds on to it for all the reasons you know better than me um and the enormous arbitrage economic arbitrage that is going on at that frothy barrier of conversion as you have urban expansion i think uh this will be an enormous challenge for india over the next 20 years as its increasing urbanization rates will only drive this lack of clarity of record keeping who's responsible for what and transfer of revenue authority um and the enormous sums of money that are currently being made and will be made for me i would dig in hard there so peter i really thank you for speaking out um and um you can consider me as your friend now because this is one thing that i'm obsessed about uh, so okay. i I, <laughs> i think you know uh, and and india is fantastic because uh, you have cities you have people you have uh rural governance so it's basically a panchayat or a rural governance but these are cities you know these are cities in full fledged cities but not recognized legally and how this agricultural land gets transformed is a is a fantastic uh, fantastic story i think we can write volumes on that um yeah so thanks thanks for speaking out and uh, last i would like to also invite hong please tell me as an urban planner you know if you are being given this dream situation what would you do yeah i think you are pana uh, i do like to suggest i mean uh, explore any any precincts for land value capture uh, approach for the slum clusters uh, especially located at the prime land uh, in the city through the open market for ppp to capture the profits uh, from the higher value properties from the higher returns from the redevelopment of uh, charge or tax uh, from the re uh, habilitation or rejuvenation uh, definitely it should be without uh, gentrification as the government uh, still uh, provide the required uh, urban services or affordable housing for the vulnerable people and low income areas as well thank you yeah fantastic um i think we have many action points i'm just wondering because we do have uh, yeah okay so i was just thinking of asking the same question to david also so david would you like to come in here and uh, uh, vidyadhar ji as you are already here i would also like to know your opinion on this revenue department and our um, spatial planning discipline uh, so first to david and then to uh, vidyadhar ji david please David, you're on mute. David, sorry, I can't uh, hear him. David, you have to unmute yourself. Now, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. No, I'm a little astonished that more attention hasn't been paid to the slum chapter of the federations. we have you know these amazing social movements in 32 nations that learn from each other support each other do incredible things much the most innovation i've seen in the collection of relevant data is done by the federations not by um other technologies if i was 
to have a big sum of money, I would give it to the Secretariat of some Shackleys International to allow them to support all 32 members and bring in other organized women federations into the um, movement. Okay, yeah. Yes, thanks, David, for bringing this point in. I think, um, um, yeah, I am also kind of very impressed with the way for such a long-term sustenance of interest and people have dedicated their lives to it. And also this Mukuru uh, experience that we are also studying is amazing, you know. And uh, the idea is that, you know, it's not that you have to have a big plan and then only you can do it. Sometimes small, small plans also becomes the big plan. So it's an aggregation, basically. I completely take your point on that. Um, maybe we should, uh, we, I, may I move on to Vidyadharji now, please? Yes. No, I think, uh, am, I, am I audible? Yeah. Yes, you are, sir. So I, the, the basic problem is that land is a subject which is handled by the Rural Development Ministry at Government of India. And uh, similarly, at the state level is the revenue departments. And they don't want to let go their hold on land as far as urban areas are concerned. And they carry the legacy of uh, maintaining the uh, land records in the colonial style, which was essentially for agricultural and rural purposes. Even within the city, when the master plan says this land can be used for residential purpose, the landowner has to first go to the revenue department, get a, no, a non-agricultural permission to do that. So I think those need to be sorted out. In 1988, uh, the National Commission on Urbanization had recommended that there should be a separate directorate of urban land records at the state level. So as soon as a city is declared by constituting a local authority, the land and land record from the uh, revenue department should get transferred to this new institution. And then they can adopt systems which are more attuned to urban requirements in terms of keeping the records. But those kind of institutional reforms are necessary. Otherwise, uh, these problems will continue because I think in land, uh, the information is power and nobody wants to share the power. You know, that kind of uh, uh, syndrome prevails very strong. Thanks for uh, bringing in this aspect because we have been always uh, imagining because as urban planner, when we get trained, I don't think our relationship with the revenue department is there. It's only when you start working mm. and you have to implement everything, then you realize that the father is somewhere else, you know, you're only talking to the son. So the decision making is done by the father who is not at all willing to talk to you. And you are talking to someone who doesn't have this uh, decision making power. So the spatial planners are basically, we can, um, we can dream, we can do a lot of, you know, uh, ideas that we can put it on the paper, but the decision is completely with the revenue department. And I hope in near future, that reform that has been suggested in 1980s uh, gets starts happening because this, I personally and also in our team, we discussed it enough and we said, okay, until unless these guys are talking to us, how do we figure it out? You know how how these things are uh, being structured. So I think this uh, juxtaposition of spatial planning with the revenue department is also one of the key things, at least in India. Where, where we need to figure it out, why there is um, such a scarcity of land, you know, um, and uh, why there is no supply of developed land, and why the land market is so skewed, because it's not that uh, our land is oozing gold or diamond, no? The land prices are comparable uh, to developed countries and um, with no services. So I think these are the questions that, uh, needs to be discussed and uh, thank you Vidyadarji for bringing in this aspect. Uh, it is also, I think, uh, a lot of uh, learning in the land value capture instruments that we did it. Um, so thank you everyone for this discussion. So I'm not trying to planning to sum it up, but I would say that, you know, this particular discussion that we had uh, kind of captured that there is a possibility of doing things together 
but it has to be together in the right in the right collaborative way you cannot have uh, planning or the plan development in an undemocratic process where you put everybody outside and few people only plan it so i think the entire thing of plan development uh, has to be inclusive and that means including everyone and everybody participates in this process rather than only ticking yes and no at the end of it so the mukuru's uh, uh, experience has been kind of i would say is a good case study for us to all understand from with this i looking at the watch i would say that uh, i would hand it over to rebecca who would take this conversation further rebecca over to you please um, <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Apana. Um, yeah, my name is Rebecca Ochong, um, Senior Manager of Operations um, at Habitat for Humanity International. I'm currently based um, in Manila. Um, I'm, I'm dialing in from Manila. So it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here today with everyone. It's been a great session. I was listening in to all the presentations. A lot of takeaways um, for me. Um, I, th I think this session um, has really um, made, made, made all of us, I believe, appreciate the special role that planning has um, in, in ensuring equitable, inclusive cities. Um, and I think it cuts across all the presentations that we have had today, right from uh, where David, David uh, started from, and then we had the presentation from Fernando, followed by Jane, and then we had Vidieta also presenting um, and then after that, we had also had the we, had, we also had the panel discussion. So I think there are several takeaways uh, for me from this session today. Um, the first one that I wanted to highlight is, uh, and I think we dwelt on this this quite a bit, is on the the issue around information. Extremely extremely important. Um, how the information that we gather is helps to inform um, how we plan. And, and also at the same time, how we gather information, right, say at the local authority level, but it's also equally important to have uh, the communities involved. And we had a lot of examples, especially from Mukuru, from Jane, Jane Weru, where she um, highlighted how the communities were involved in, in the mapping and enumeration and how that all fits together. But at the same time with the issue around information, I think um, a lot of uh, issues have come up, for example, the politics of data, how do we um, you know who owns the data? How is it shared? Uh, but at the same time, we need to recognize that the technology is inevitable, it's essential. So how do we ensure that the information that is gathered is not misused, it's used in, a, in an ethical manner and that we address any power imbalances um, around that? So um, really a key important inf uh, you know, area that I think we need to look at, we need that information um, for, for planning. Um, another key area that has been highlighted is the need for a people-centered approach uh, to uh, planning. Uh, I think participation came out very strongly. It's important to ensure that um, everyone, all the, everyone is included in the process and the community is also empowered um, to, um, to be able to participate in the process. So it's not just about uh, being counted in numbers, but at least uh, they have to be able to meaningfully engage um, in the whole process. Um, and, and, and then I think another area also um, that was also raised, I think Jog mentioned this is about the need for democratic processes. I think that also still fits in uh, with having, ensuring a people-centered approach. If we have a democratic process, it ensures that uh, we acknowledge uh, that, uh, you know, the citizens' right um, to, to, to be able to participate. And then also there's the, the element of co-production with communities um, that has also been raised quite a bit. And uh, because I, 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 when we co-produce with communities, then it ensures uh, there's that ownership um, in terms of the planning that we do and, and, and that their interests are, are, are taken into consideration. Another key area that, that has been raised and also came through many of the presentations, I think, for example, the one from India of uh, the Mumbai slum upgrading one, and then also for the Sao Paulo case is the issue around financing. And uh, looking at this, um, you see how they've leveraged uh, land and property taxes at the same time using uh, land value capture mechanisms um, to finance uh, whether it's land upgrading or social housing or the provision of other infrastructure. So uh, financing is very important. And I, and I like also um, the input that came from 
um, from Teresa, where she talked about, of course, she talked about information first, but then also uh, stressed the importance of financing, uh, very important for, uh, for the planning. Um, the issue around partnerships also came out very strongly, the need for partnerships, there's a role for the communities, there's a role for government to play, there's also the role for the private sector, um, that's uh, utterly important. Um, then the, the social movement um, angle was also brought in uh, from the cases from Brazil, but I think also David high, highlighted um, the, the campaign, I think it was called Know Your City campaign by SDI, that has been very instrumental in empowering many communities um, to advocate for you know, services to be brought um, to many informal, informal settlement communities. And then the, ever end, the never ending issue around uh, land tenure um, in many informal settlements, uh, we have both the de jure and the de facto um, tenure, tenure types that, that are there. So, and the issue around lack of documentation, which continues to be there, um, you know, how do, we re, how do we recognize the diversity of tenure types that are there and, 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 and just dealing with some of those issues around land tenure. I think it's, it's persistent and um, I think it's cutting across, uh, but I think we see that in some, some, some cases we are seeing uh, governments are re realizing the importance and trying to see uh, ways how uh, those rights can be recognized and uh, so that those communities are, are incorporated in the planning, are included in the planning processes. So uh, those are some of my key takeaways uh, from the session today. Um, it's been a great session um, and I really want to thank everyone today, all the speakers, uh, for uh, the very uh, lively, um, you know, um, input uh, for all, all, all the information that has been shared. And um, I want to thank everyone, all the participants, and um, it's really been a, a real pleasure and a, a great learning experience uh, for me particularly. So thank you all and uh, uh, all the best and uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, wherever you are. Thank you very much. Thank you, and we hope to see all of you on 22nd. Thank you, everyone. Bye Thanks. for today. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.